We want to start tonight with the U.S. Supreme Court's decision to overturn the long-standing precedent designed to help higher education institutions achieve diversity. Affirmative action. Believed to benefit black and Latino students, this policy angered some Asian American students who say they were unfairly looked over. I'm ecstatic about this decision. It means that Asian Americans can finally get treated on their merits. Guys, we know why Asian Americans are, should get into Harvard at disproportionate rates. It's because they study twice as many hours as the average American. It's not because of their race. It's because of their culture. It's because of their family values. Academic excellence, that should be prioritized. Thursday, the Supreme Court ruled that colleges can no longer consider race for admissions. Based on recent polling, most Americans agree with the Supreme Court. A CBS News and YouGov poll this month found that 70% of Americans agree with the high court. In another poll by Pew Research Center, about 50% of U.S. adults say they disapprove of colleges taking race and ethnicity into account to increase diversity at the school. In that same poll, 49% said consideration of race and ethnicity makes the overall admissions process less fair. Jessica Schneider breaks down how this ruling will have major ramifications for generations to come. The Supreme Court stirring up protests with its decision gutting affirmative action, saying colleges and universities can no longer rely on race in the admissions process. But prospective students are still allowed to talk about how their race has shaped their experiences in their applications. The 6-3 opinion written by Chief Justice John Roberts will now prohibit students from checking a box indicating their race, specifically saying the practice at Harvard and University of North Carolina cannot be recognized reconciled with the guarantees of the Equal Protection Clause. The majority not explicitly saying they are overruling more than four decades of precedent that allowed affirmative action, but the three liberal justices writing, today this court stands in the way and rolls back decades of precedent and momentous progress. I'm really most worried about, you know, the youth and like um, the students younger than us in high school and middle school and elementary school who might not get the same opportunity that I did. The two cases were brought by the group Students for Fair Admissions, led by activist Edward Bloom, who has fought for nearly a decade to eradicate affirmative action. Classifying students by race and ethnicity, treating them differently because of their race and ethnicity, is it's unfair. At the forefront of the Harvard fight, Asian students who argued they were disadvantaged because Harvard prioritized other minorities and used a personal rating score that did not rank them favorably. Hello. The issue is deeply personal to Justice Sonia Sotomayor as the first woman of color on the Supreme Court. She issued a fiery dissent accusing the majority of employing an unjustified exercise of power that will only serve to highlight the court's own impotence in the face of an America whose cries for equality resound. Justice Sotomayor has been outspoken in the past, saying that using other methods to ensure diversity won't work. It's not that I don't believe it works. I don't think the statistics show it works. In fact, when California banned affirmative action in 1996, UC Berkeley said black and Hispanic representation on their campus dropped by 50 percent. But Justice Clarence Thomas, one of two black justices on the high court, spoke in personal terms, too, saying he believes the Constitution well, is colorblind. You, While I am painfully aware of the social and economic ravages which have befallen my race and all who suffer discrimination, I hold out enduring hope that this country will live up to its principles, that all men are created equal, are equal citizens, and must be treated equally before the law. Justice Ketanji Brown Jackson, the first black woman on the court, pushed back in a separate dissent, bashing the majority opinion as exuding a let them eat cake obliviousness and said, deeming race irrelevant in law does not make it so in life. Reaction to the ruling has been mixed and swift. The African American Mayors Association released a statement saying, quote, undoubtedly the long term effects of this decision will have unforeseen far sweeping impacts on our nation as a whole. Justice is never achieved when the scales are tipped against those who already bear the weight of centuries of inequity. This decision by the Supreme Court is the latest in a long line of actions meant to strip black and brown people and women of their access to the American dream. Affirmative action was not merely a policy, but a promise to strive for a nation where color does not dictate destiny. The Supreme Court knew that, and they abolished it anyway, end quote.
The Supreme Court ruled the U.S. military academies can continue to take race into consideration as a factor for admissions, essentially exempting them from this ruling. Joining me now to discuss this is Risha Grant. She is a diversity and inclusion expert. She's the founder and CEO of Risha Grant LLC, an award-winning diversity consultant firm. She's also the author of the new book, Be Better Than Your BS. Also with us tonight is uh, legal scholar Vinay Harpalani. He is the Lee and Leon Karlitz Chair in Evidence and Procedure. He's also a professor of law at the University of New Mexico School of Law. I want to welcome both of you to the GRIO. Uh, studies show that white women, Risha, benefit from affirmative action the most, and black women are now among the most educated group in the country. That said, uh, do we need affirmative action, black folk, at this stage? We still need affirmative action. I think that we see many instances every day of how America consistently fails people of color. And affirmative action was supposed to level the playing field. Um, if we didn't need it, you know, I, I, that would have been fixed a long time ago. So unfortunately, we're still in a place where it is very much needed. The notion of black and Hispanic students getting preferential treatment uh, is interesting, uh, Vinay, seeing how the court didn't ban uh, certain gender uh, uh, standards or uh, athletic-based ad ad admissions, you know, scholarships and such. They didn't ban legacies. They didn't ban wealth-conscious admissions. Uh, what do you make of that? I think, I mean, the court's precedent, Supreme Court has always said using race is really bad. You know, any racial classification by the government should be subject to strict scrutiny. You need a really compelling reason if the government is going to classify individuals by race. And you can only do it as much as you need to. So there's a long line of cases from the Supreme Court that treats race differently from all of the other statuses that you just mentioned. Now, something like legacy preferences, we know that white students benefit the most from legacy preferences, from alumni preferences, but other students also benefit. There are some black alumni, some Asian American alumni from Harvard who benefit from those. So it's not exclusively racial, and therefore the court uh, treats it differently. And, and I guess the question for me, Vinay, uh, is why? I, I get I get your point that, that that a legacy admission, for example, isn't exclusively black, right? Because you know a second generation uh, Harvard student now has a shot. Uh, at getting some of that same hookup that white folk got for the last 50, 60 years or a couple hundred years, actually. Mm -hmm. I get that. But I guess the question is, why is it OK? If they're saying it's wrong for your race to determine at all whether or not you get into school, why is your wealth something that they're OK being a determinant in whether or not you get into school? I mean, it's a great question. You know, and, and, you know, Supreme Court has ruled that, uh, you know, wealth disparities, wealth classifications, uh, differences in socioeconomic status, uh, you know, that's something that the court can't really do anything about, you know, and, and in a sense, that's part of our capitalist system, right? You're going to have wealth, uh, wealth inequities, but it's just said, you know, race has historically been used to oppress, you know, um, you go back to the founding of this country, uh, you know, de jure segregation, racial segregation by law. And what the court has really done here is it's kind of turned around Brown v. Board of Education, you know, because back in, you know, back in 1954, we had racially segregated schools, schools that were mandated by law to be segregated, separate schools for black and white students. Uh, and at that time, you know, Thurgood Marshall and NAACP Legal Defense Fund said, we want the government to stop using race. You know, we want the government to not segregate people by race. Uh, and what the court has done is said, well, let's take that principle and say we can't use race at all. You know, they didn't think it was use, good to use race to segregate. And that's the same as affirmative action that you know tends to benefit people of color. Uh, that's the way the court has uh, uh, framed it because of this history of uh, you know racial oppression. Kind of taking that, say any consideration of race is bad. Wow, it, which is stunning to me, Risha. When I co we come back, I want to get your take on this because this is bizarre. It's like we're acting like black and white are opposite sides of the same coin. That considering race to exclude black folk is the same thing as considering race to support black folk after hundreds of years of excluding them. It's it's bizarre logic that I don't fully understand. We're going to get these two brilliant people's take on it on the other side of this break. Welcome back to The Griot. Before the break, we were discussing the Supreme Court's decision to overturn affirmative action. Harvard was one of the two schools at the center of the, this case. And on Saturday, Harvard will make history 
when the school's first black president takes her position. Here's what Claudine Gay had to say about the ruling. Harvard vigorously defended our admissions process and our belief that we all benefit from learning, living, and working alongside people of different backgrounds and experiences. We will comply with the court's decision, but it does not change our values. We continue to believe deeply that a thriving, diverse intellectual community is essential to academic excellence and critical to shaping the next generation of leaders. For many, this decision feels deeply personal. It means the real possibility that opportunities will be foreclosed. But at Harvard, it has also strengthened our resolve to continue opening doors. To our future students, know that we want you here. We are eager to welcome you to our community. Claudine Gay is the daughter of Haitian immigrants and has been a professor at Harvard since 2006, where she has taught government and African and African-American studies. Back with me is Risha Grant. She is a diversity and inclusion expert. She's the founder and CEO of Risha Grant LLC, an award-winning diversity consultant firm. She's also the author of a new book that you better buy. It's called Be Better Than Your BS. We also have attorney Vinay Harpalani. He is the Lee and Leon Carolitz Chair in Evidence and Procedure also a professor of law at the University of New Mexico School of Law. Okay, so, Risha, at least nine states have banned affirmative action, even before this case came before the Supreme Court. Uh, if race isn't considered, how can institutions level the playing field and prevent discrimination, or, and, and not just discrimination, but just a lack of access for, for black students? I don't think you can. I mean, we consistently see instances of that. It's as if the Supreme Court felt like we were already in a place where inequality and inequities don't exist anymore, yet we see instances of racism on a daily basis. So there is no way that we can do that unless we are going to actually take a stand and say, we've got to get more students of color into this university. We've got to get more people of color into this corporation because we are gonna see that trickle down into these different industries. And so I think unless we make a concerted effort to make sure that we are placing people of color, we're gonna to continue to get what we've always gotten, which is not very much. And some people will look at Harvard and say, well, look, it's, it's not necessary. They got a black president at Harvard, a black woman president, the daughter of Haitian immigrants. I mean, this is what can happen in this country if you just work hard, pull yourself up by those bootstraps and do the work, right? That's what people will say, Risha. I mean, um, how do we respond to those kinds of narratives? Okay, they said the same thing when we had the first black president in, in Obama, right? But we still, again, I know I, I keep repeating myself, but we are still seeing these same things. We saw a country led by a black man for eight years follow up with Trump, right? Vinay, you work in a university as well. Uh, and, you know, law school is a perfect example. And you work in a law school. Law school is a perfect example of a place where black students are often underrepresented. Um, is there anything that institutions can do to respond to this. I, Harvard gave a kind of sly response in their letter to their community last night. They were kind of like, um, yeah, we were told that we can't uh, you know, use affirmative action anymore, but we were told that race can be a factor uh, in, uh, in admissions to the extent that we can talk about how race has influenced your life, uh, being discriminated against, or having some kind of experience. Then they said, we will follow the rules. It almost felt like a wink, like we still gonna work that thing in, but is, is there a way to strategically or structurally or systemically respond to this ruling in a way that doesn't just end up with a whole bunch of black and brown folk not in school anymore. You know, one thing about institutions like Harvard, Ivy League institutions, all these elite institutions, they have been very elitist in their admissions policies. Uh, and one thing, you know, you do see pressure to do things like uh, stop using standardized tests, uh, you know, consider socioeconomic inequities more, uh, look at like, you know, first generation college status, all those things that have also uh, been barriers and disproportionately affect uh, students of color. Uh, so, you know, even since the COVID-19 pandemic started, a lot of schools started making SAT scores optional. Uh, you know, Harvard has them optional now, whether they'll bring them back or not, we'll have to see. But there are other measures that can be, that, that can be put into place 
uh, you know, greater recruitment from certain places. And I think, you know, if there is kind of a bit of a silver lining here, it's that it's going to force elite institutions, if they want to remain diverse, to do things that, you know, maybe they haven't been doing as much, you know, look at their academic criteria, different things. Are these biased against certain groups? Uh, are these, you know, does, does uh, really be, do, do these criteria really benefit rich kids a lot, you know, things like SATs? So if there is any kind of silver lining, it's going to force them to, to really confront their own elitism and look at other measures they may need to take uh, to recruit a diverse group of students. I hope you are right that that is the silver lining. Richard, do you, do you uh, anticipate us seeing that silver lining? My, my fear is that they'll say, hey, we did what we could. Our hands are tied. The law is the law. Uh, come on in, white people. Well, Mark, you know, that's where activism comes in, right? That's when, you know, you go back to the origins of affirmative action in the late 60s. It was because black students and other students were protesting on, on college campuses. You know, that was in the wake of uh, Dr. Martin Luther King's assassination, all types of upheaval in this country. And that's when you started seeing, seeing universities take more measures to admit more black students, more students of color generally. So it's going to be up to us. You know, it's going to be up to people, uh, you know, just forcing, holding universities accountable to do things like that. Uh, okay. R Risha, I'm going to place the future of this country in the capable, brilliant, amazing hands of black women, particularly you. Give me a prediction. What do we look like? in 10 years? What does this country look like in 20 years with regard to this matter? I think if we are going to actually turn this thing around, we're all going to have to be better than our BS. Um, and, and I know, you know, that's a play on the book, but it, it's the truth. People are out here making decisions. You know, we talk about policies, we talk about laws, this is ran by people. People are making decisions to marginalize. People are making decisions not to allow a student to enroll based upon their race and ethnicity. People can do better than that. And again, removing this law does not mean that people are going to magically do the right thing. If that were the case, they would already have done it. I believe that we are going to have to systemically root out that racism. We're gonna to have to understand our unconscious bias. And then we're going to make a concerted decision to be better than we have been in the past and do the right thing. Right, family, we have reached the end of the show, but before I let you go, I know a lot of you are upset about the recent Supreme Court decisions, and I understand why. They have destroyed women's access to reproductive justice. Now they're striking down affirmative action. We have bad news in front of us, but I'm going to say two things. One, we got here because we weren't paying enough attention. They've been organizing these fights for decades. They've been lining up their troops for 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 years. When you look at what's happened at the state level and at the national level, it is the result of years of grassroots organizing and activism and voting. And we have to do the same. When we think elections don't matter, when we think outcomes don't matter, when we think candidates don't matter, when we think state level politics doesn't matter, all of it matters. And we find out just how much it matters when we see decisions like the ones we've seen in the last 12 months. But black folk have faced bad news before. Before there was a Brown v. Board of Education, there was a Plessy versus Ferguson. We've always had bad news before we had good news, and this will be no different. We will transform this moment of pain into power, but it's not magic. It doesn't fall out of the sky. We have to fight. We have to vote. We have to organize. And even when it looks like we lost, we got to keep going. Republicans lost, and they kept going. They lost Roe v. Wade, and they stayed till Dobbs. We got to do the same thing. Joy will come in the morning, but only after a night of struggle.